Assalamu alaikum, dear brothers and sisters, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to welcome you all to our ninth session on the tafsir of Surah Al Anbiya, which is the 21st Surah of the Quran. Alhamdulillah, <clears throat> we have been able to reach ayah number 36 of the Surah, and inshallah, uh, today, in, uh, in this session, we're going to be covering verses uh, 36 to ayah number uh, 40, inshallah. So ayah number 36. And, and if, uh, if it's possible, if you guys have a, an, a Quran app or the Mus'haf, I would recommend that you, uh, that you recite along with me, that you, that you actually have a copy of the Quran and uh, you know, really try to treat this as a, as a class where you take notes and uh, you really engage with the, uh, the scripture. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 36, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 36, and whenever those who disbelieve see you, they take you as nothing but mockery. They take you as nothing but a joke. Is this, they say, is this the one who makes mention of your gods? And it is they who are disbelievers in the remembrance of the beneficent. To understand what this ayah is speaking about, you have to understand something about the personality of the Prophet. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, one of his most unique qualities is his, his ability to encompass believers and non-believers with his mercy. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi showed great concern and care for all people. And he actually felt great distress. He felt great pain when he would see people living lives of sin and ignorance and corruption. It would hurt the Prophet whenever he would see someone being disconnected from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he alludes to this in Surah at tawbah I number 128, where he says, min anfusikum. Allah is addressing the Meccans. He's addressing Quraysh. That indeed a messenger has come from among you. Muhammad ibn Abdullah is not, he's not a stranger. You know, he's not someone who's foreign to you. He's someone that you know. He's someone that was born in your midst. He comes from a very well-known family. You saw him grow up. You're very familiar with his background. I did not send you someone who was unknown, someone who was foreign. And this Rasul, this individual that I, ha that I have appointed to guide you, to teach you, to inspire you, to educate you, to enlighten you. He has so much concern and so much compassion for people that Allah says, Azizun alayhi ma anittum. He is distressed when you suffer, when you suffer physically and spiritually. Rasulullah, in the same way that when a parent sees their child not doing well in school, or they see their, their child suffering of an illness. It's actually the parent who suffers the most because the parent has great love for the child. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he is the spiritual parent of all of humanity. And therefore he feels pain. It hurts him when he sees ignorant people like Abu Jahl like Abu Lahab, like the Bedouin Arabs who were uneducated, unrefined, who had no 
relationship with their Lord, who were heedless of their creator. This actually took an emotional toll on the Prophet because Rasulullah was a lover of humanity. He wanted the best for people. Azizun alayhima anitsum. When you suffer, Rasulullah suffers because he has this type of affinity towards you. Harisun alaykum. So Allah here is describing the Prophet's relationship with all people. Harisun alaykum. Harisun alaykum means that he's very protective of you. You know, hirs, it usually refers to being greedy. You know, when you're very possessive, you're very protective. But here it's used in a, in a positive light. It has a positive connotation here. Meaning the Prophet sees you as one of his own, that you belong to him. He's protective of you. No matter who you are, no matter what your background is, Rasulullah has hirs. He sees you as a member of his flock, a member of his community. Harisun alayhi. And this is how the Prophet was with all people. And this is why when, when, when they stone him, he doesn't even condemn them. He says, oh Allah, forgive them. They're ignorant. They don't know. Allahumma ghfir li qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun. The Prophet is always asking Allah to, you know, forgive them. Don't punish them. Harisun alaykum. And then Allah at the end of the ayah, again, this is Surah 9, verse 128. At the end of the ayah, Allah speaks about the Prophet's relationship with Mu'mineen. Azizun alayhima anittum. Harisun alaykum is with everybody. Bil mu'mineen, bil mu'mineen ra'ufur rahim. With mu'mineen, the Prophet is even more. He's so kind. He is so merciful. So everyone enjoys this prophetic care, this prophetic concern. But mu'mineen are given special, a special type of affection and love and mercy. And subhanAllah, do you see a parallel between the way the Prophet conducts himself and the way Allah interacts with his creation? So Allah is ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. His Rahmaniya is that mercy which reaches all things. His Rahimiya, that he's Rahim. This is the special mercy that is afforded to those who believe. Similarly, Rasulullah is azizun alayhima anittum harisun alaykum with all people, but with mu'mineen he is what? Ra'ufur rahim. You see how the Prophet is, is mirroring those attributes of, of uh, you know, those attributes of universal mercy and special mercy. Now, so this goes to show you, brothers and sisters, that one of the unique qualities of the Prophet is that he, he never used to dismiss people. He never dismissed people. He was always very optimistic. He was hopeful that one day Abu Jahl would, would become Muslim. He had hope that maybe one day Abu Sufyan, Abu Lahab, and that's why he tried so hard to soften their hearts. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he speaks to Musa, and you know, it's interesting that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends Musa and Harun to Fir'aun, Allah has to tell Musa and Fir'aun, you know, in Surah Taha, Surah 20, Ayah 44, Allah has to tell Musa and Fir'aun and, and Harun, فَقُولَ لَهُ قَوْلًا لَيِّنَا that speak to him gently. He has to give Musa and Harun an akhlaqi pointer. He has to give them, you know, some instructions on how. But with the Prophet, Allah doesn't need to tell the Prophet that, you know, be merciful. Because it's, it's in the Prophet's nature to be merciful. With Musa and Harun, yes, they are merciful. But Allah has to tell them to be even more merciful, be even more lenient. But with Muhammad ibn Abdullah, he is so merciful that Allah, now, so now we go back to Surah Al-Anbiya, Ayah 36. Allah has to tell the Prophet, وَإِذَا رَآكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا That when these kuffar, when they see you, 
Whenever those who disbelieve see you, they take you as nothing but a joke. Meaning that, Ya Rasulullah, they are not deserving of your care and your concern. They take you as nothing but a joke. And they ridicule you. They mock you by saying, Ahad al-ladhi yadhkuru alihatakum. Is this, is this the one who talks about our idols? And notice, they don't mention what the Prophet says. They just say, all they say is, is this the one who makes mention of your gods? They don't mention that the, that the Prophet says that he condemns them, that he speaks ill of them. Because look at the loyalty of the kuffar, that these idol worshippers, they are so loyal to their idols that they don't even want to relay the Prophet's condemnation of idol worship because they see it as blasphemous. They don't even want to relay the, the blasphemy. And then Allah says at the end of the ayah, وَهُمْ بِذِكْرَ الرَّحْمَانِ هُمْ كَافِرُونَ they don't, they're so careful about saying anything blasphemous about the idols, but they say the most blasphemous things about Allah Azza wa Jal, about Ar-Rahman. And, and this, is, this is something that, that we also observe. The idol, the, the mushrikeen, they used to put the idols on a pedestal. The idols were perfect. They would not even dare to say anything blasphemous about the idols. Today, we have certain philosophies and certain ideas that we treat as idols. For example, postmodernity. We treat it as an idol. Liberalism, humanism, feminism, extreme forms of feminism, we treat them as idols. And we, when we speak about Allah and Islam, we speak about the Sharia as some archaic regressive tradition. But postmodernity is the, is what is the, is the idol. Capitalism, feminism, those are the things that we, that we refer to as the moral standard that we treat these philosophies and these ideas as gods. And, when, and whenever we study Islam, we try to bend Islam to conform with those lofty ideals that we think are lofty. That we, we study Islam through the lens of postmodernism. We study Islam through the lens of feminism. We study Islam through the lens of humanism or liberalism and all of the other isms that we treat as idols. We don't even dare criticize these philosophies, but, we, we, but what do we do? We criticize God, we criticize his sharia, and we look, we, we take it as a joke, as Islam is this outdated, archaic tradition, while, while what? While these, you know, what's taught in academia, yeah, this is, this is what we should aspire to. We have to understand that Islam, we have to have the confidence as Muslims to really believe that Islam is a superior tradition. Today, unfortunately, Muslims, they have this inferiority complex where they always feel like they have to defend. We're always on the defensive. Why? We should, we should, constructly, we should constructively criticize Postmodernity, humanism, liberalism, with the same zeal and with the same fervor that some of some non-Muslims criticize Islam. So in seventh century Arabia, the stones were idols. But in the year 2019, we have certain philosophies that have become idols that are even above scrutiny, that are above criticism, that we We've just assumed, you know, a lot of Western civilization is predicated on certain philosophical assumptions that many of us, we don't even talk about. And it's as though it's a given. Yeah, these are philosophical truths. And we build, a, so we as Muslims, we need to examine the philosophical presuppositions upon which Western civilization is built.
an Eastern civilization is built. So instead of always being on the, the defensive, we should also be on the offensive, meaning that you know you you have to explain why postmodernism, liberalism, human, humanism is a superior tradition. That we should it shouldn't just be a given that these are things that are so wonderful and so great, and we have to we have to bend Islam to conform with these new idols. You see. Idol worship, we shouldn't think it's just, you know, stones and, you know, material things. No, sometimes we, we treat ideas, isms as gods, and we place it above Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we, 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 pl we put, we take Allah's sharia ah and we put it at the feet of these isms and we try to understand them in light of those those you know philosophical idols that we've created now going back to the uh the surah ayah number 37 and this is a very very interesting a very beautiful so so again going back to uh, before i go to the uh the next ayah so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 36, he's essentially reminding that the Prophet that these people are not deserving. They don't deserve your care and concern because all they, they just they take you as a joke, Ya Rasulullah. They do nothing but mock you. So don't feel sorry for them. And if you look at the Quran, so the Prophet ﷺ, he had this this quality of always being hopeful, being optimistic, trying to always see the best in people. And Islam really is a culture of hope. And the Prophet ﷺ in the Quran, he is called what? Ya ayyuha rasul inna arsalnaka shahidan wa mubashiran wa nadira. You know, one of the names of the Prophet is that he is Bashir. He is the the bearer of glad tidings meaning he inspires hope in people he's bashir and he's also a nadir he's a warner but even when the prophet warns rasulullah is not trying to scare us when he speaks to us about divine punishment and the consequences of our actions when we say that the prophet is a warner all the Prophet wants is to bring our attention to the seriousness of our lives, that it's not a joke. You have to wake up. You have to realize that you were created for a higher purpose. So even when he is nadir, he's not trying to scare you or demoralize you or strip you of, of hope or fill your heart with fear. No, the Prophet wants to revive our sense of purpose. So he's Bashir and Nadir. So verse number 36 is basically Allah telling the Prophet that, Ya Rasulullah, your heart is full of so, mercy, so much mercy and you have so much care and concern for people. But these people who mock you, who make fun of you, who taunt you, who take you as nothing but a joke, they don't deserve your care. They don't deserve your concern. Don't waste your... your uh, your emotional concern on them. They don't deserve it. And then Allah says in ayah number 37, Allah says, man was created of haste. Soon shall I show you my signs, so seek not to hasten me. Now, خُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ مِنْ عَجَلِ It's a very interesting way of, of expressing this idea that man, insan, the human being was created of haste. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is essentially saying 
that people, all human beings, they possess the trait of being hasty, that this is part of the nature of the human being. And in some people, this quality is manifest, and in others, it's dormant, but it's in every person. This, this sense of, uh, of ajala. And Allah says that he created man, man was created of haste, meaning that this quality of being hasty and impatient is a weakness that has been created in human beings. And it is, it is such a deep rooted quality that, that it's as if Allah created us of haste. You know, Allah created us of clay, of teen, of turab. But this quality of ajala, of being hasty and impatient, is so ingrained in the human soul that it's as if Allah created us of haste. So it's a type of hyperbole. Because the mushrikeen, whenever the Prophet would speak about paradise and hellfire and punishment, what would they usually say? They say, if it's true, then let it happen now. If hell is real, if, if divine punishment is real, we want, we want to see it now, right? So if you look at Surah Al-Anfal, ayah number 32, if you, mo most prophets, when they warned their communities that if you continue committing sin and you continue defying and opposing the truth, God's wrath will descend upon you. 99% of the time, what was the reaction of the people? What was the reaction? Yeah, you're right. We should make toba. that, you know, maybe we should think about this. Maybe we should take our lives more seriously. Maybe we should consider the validity of what you're saying? No. The answer is what? وَإِذْ قَالُوا اللَّهُمَّ إِنْ كَانَ هَذَا هُوَ الْحَقُّ مِنْ عِنْدِكْ فَأَمْطِرْ عَلَيْنَا حِجَارَةً مِنَ السَّمَاءِ أَوْ اِئْتِنَا بِعَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ They would say, oh God, if this is true, if what your prophet is saying is true, then rain down upon us punishment from the sky. Allahu Akbar. That they say, we, we, want, we want to see the punishment now. See how hasty the human being is? How impatient? And this is not just talking about mushrikeen. All people, we have this quality in us. You know, when we make dua, for example, when we make dua, what happens when Allah doesn't give us what we want right away? We become impatient. You know, sometimes people, they come to me and they say, Shaykh, I'm so frustrated. I've, I've been begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I've been making dua day and night and he doesn't answer me. And you say, and then you find out that they've made, they've, they made dua for three days. <laughs> As if they want Allah to, to respond to them right away. They're impatient. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he speaks about people, the human being, in Surah Al-Isra, Surah 17, Ayah number 11, he says, وَيَدْعُ الْإِنسَانُ بِالشَّرِّ دُعَاءَهُ بِالْخَيْرِ That human beings, they pray for evil with the same passion that they pray for good. وَكَانَ الْإِنسَانُ عَجُولًا Meaning, sometimes... We want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us something and we want him to give it to us now. But if Allah were to grant us our prayers at the time that we wanted, we would be praying for our, our own destruction. So Allah Azza wa Jal, he knows what is good for us and he knows when to give it to us. We have to trust Allah's timing. And that's the problem with people. We live in this culture of instant gratification. 
And we expect Allah Azza wa Jal to comply with this culture. That when I make dua, Ilahi, you have to be like Amazon Prime. My dua needs to be like Amazon Prime right away. And when, when, when I want to know the truth, we want to understand realities right away. We don't even have the patience when it comes to acquiring knowledge. You know, even when we were in the, in the Hawza, there, there are some students, they come to the Islamic seminaries. And you know, when you, when you study Hawza, when you study in the Islamic seminary, you have to start off with the elementary subjects. You have to study the boring subjects. You have to study Arabic grammar, Arabic morphology. You have to study mantiq, logic. And a lot of these subjects are very dry. They're very theoretical. And some students, they say, when are we going to study Arfan? When are we going to study? Oh, they want to go straight to the exotic sciences. Why? Right? The, the human being has been created of haste. We don't have patience. We don't have patience. When we suffer, when we're experiencing a bala, we want, we want, we complain so much. You know, this is why when you look at the story of Ayyub, Ayyub lived in comfort for 80 years, some narrations say. And he suffered great tribulations for seven years. When his family, when his wife would say that, you know, we've been suffering for so long, make, ask Allah to remove this bala from us, that ask Allah to remove the hardships and the calamities. He says to his wife that, oh, my dear wife, we have been living in ni'mah for 80 years and we've been living in hardship for seven. And I'm too embarrassed to ask Allah to remove the hardship when it's only been seven years while I have enjoyed 80 years of health and wealth and comfort. You see, Ayyub understands that you know, human beings, they're, you know, they're too hasty. Maybe this is good for me. Maybe my soul is developing important virtues during this time of bala. So, so Allah says, so خُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ مِنْ عَجَلِ Man has been created of haste. So Allah says, سَأُرِيكُمْ آيَاتِي فَلَا تَسْتَعْجِلُونَ You know, the interesting thing about mushrikeen, about people in general, is that we are hasty, we are impatient, and we expect Allah to also be hasty. Allah says, I will soon show you my signs. So do not, so do not, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so do not hasten me. Just because you're always in a rush and you're impatient, don't, don't expect me, don't rush me. Allah says, you're ignorant. You don't know. I'm al-Hakim. I do things at their appropriate time. Because ajala, the meaning of, uh, of ajal is to want something before its appointed time. While Allah Azza wa Jal, everything that he does, there is precision in the timing. So Allah says, soon, don't worry, soon you're going to see the punishment that you were begging for, that you wanted to see. Soon you will see the truth that you were seeking. Soon I will grant your dua, whatever it may be. You will soon see my signs, but don't rush me. Just because you have this quality of ajala, don't try to impose this hastiness and this recklessness on me. Just because you're reckless, don't think that your creator, your Lord is reckless. Don't think that he's hasty. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, you know, if, if you go to Surah Al-Insan, ayah number 27, you know, this is why people, people like dunya, because dunya is in with, within reach. You tell them about akhirah, that, oh, I have to wait for the akhirah. No, I want the instant gratification of dunya. Because one of the meanings of dunya is something that is close. We chase after things that give us immediate pleasure. 
But Allah says, it would be better if you delay gratification for the akhirah, because the pleasure of the hereafter is greater than the pleasures of dunya, because dunya is very limited. Your capacity to enjoy and experience pleasure in this physical world is very limited. So don't sell your akhirah for fleeting, temporary, immediate pleasures. In you in Haula, you habun al Ajil Ajila, whether wara ahum yom and thaqila. There are people who they they ignore the weight of the day of judgment because they want they hasten towards the immediate pleasures, the instant gratifications they find in dunya. Ayah number 38. So Allah here, He gives us a glimpse into this hastiness that is in the mushrikeen. So the Prophet is Bashir and he's Nadir. He warns them of punishment if they continue to rebel. If they, if they continue in their iniquities. But what do they say? And notice that it's a present and future tense verb, meaning that this is something, this is how they're responding to divine warnings all the time. That, and they say, when will this promise come to pass? You talk about Jahannam. You talk about hellfire, punishment, day of judgment. When is this going to happen, O Muhammad? When will this promise come to pass if you are truthful? Meaning if you're telling the truth, we should see it now. We should, we should witness and taste the punishment now if you're truthful. So the implication is that you're lying. Because that's not happening now, because... We're sinning and we're opposing you and we're fighting you and nothing is happening to us. That means that it's not true. So again, they're basically, they're begging for punishment. They're basically taunting Allah Azza wa Jal. They're taunting the messenger saying that you guys are all talk. If divine punishment is true, if Yom al Qiyamah is true, let's see it. Put your money where your mouth is, as they say. This is, this is the, the audacity. This is what the Prophet was dealing with. You know, sometimes we forget how, how much grief the Prophet, how rude they were to the Prophet. And then Allah says, look at the next ayah, ayah number 39. <laughs> That these mushrikeen, you know, they talk a big game now. They ask for punishment now. But Allah says, if those who disbelieved, but knew of the time, if they could only know, if they, if they could only witness when they shall not be able to hold back the fire from their faces or from their backs, nor be helped. Allah says that they have, they sound very bold now. They taunt and they ask for the punishment to come now. Allah says if, if, if they could only see this Jahannam that they're asking for now, and if they were to see this Jahannam and the, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to even, you know, yakuf comes from the word kaf. Kaf means palm. You know, your natural defense mechanism when someone, when, you're, when you see harm, is that what? You put your hands up. You know, if you don't have any other form of protection, if there's, a, if there's harm or if there's an enemy, if there's a threat that comes to you, your natural instinct is to put your hands up. This is the meaning of yakufuhum. So, لو يعلم الذين كفروا, If the kuffar only knew, if they only knew the time when, they would not be able to repel. Repel what? Repel the fire that is going to burn their faces and their backs. Allahu Akbar. 
their faces and their backs, meaning that this Jahannam, this hellfire that they think is a game and they're taunting and they're asking for this punishment, Allah says this fire is going to surround them. It's going to surround them and they won't even be able to protect their faces and their backs. Meaning that it's not a it's not a fire, you know. Usually, when you know, if you think of a bonfire, usually when there's a fire, it comes at you from one angle, you know. So, for example, you know, you're you have you're you're uh, cooking s'mores over the fire, and then say there's a gust of wind and the flame comes in your face, right? It's coming at you from one angle and you pull back. But Jahannam is different, brothers and sisters. The hellfire is not just coming at you from one direction. Na'udhu billah. It's coming at you from in front of you and from behind you. Meaning that this hellfire is going to envelope you. That there's nowhere to run. You know, you, you know, when there's a fire, you can run away because fire is coming at you from one direction usually. But how do you run away? How do you, how do you protect yourself from a fire that has engulfed you, that surrounds you, where if you run in any direction, you're running towards fire. Allah says in Surah Al-Kahf, Surah 18, Ayah number 29, in We have prepared for Zalimin. And a Zalim can, you know, Allah, see Allah is not, you know, sometimes Allah says Zalim. This could be someone who even claimed to be Muslim. You know, there are many people who claim to be Muslims, but they, their Islam was just lip service. They were zalimin, they were oppressors of themselves and others. The zalim, the, the oppressors, Allah says, I have prepared for them naran ahata bihim saradiquha. I have prepared a fire that will surround them like walls. Walls of fire surrounding them. Now, when you're surrounded by that much fire, you, you call out for help in desperation. You know, istighatha comes from the word ghaith, and ghaith means torrential rain that comes after a long drought. You know, farmers, when there's a drought, and there's no rain. You know, look at how precise the Arabic language is. The rain, the strong, the heavy rain that comes after a period of great desperation, a period of great a drought, this is called ghaith. So these people who are in Jahannam, they are so desperate that they're calling for relief. They're, they're asking for what? For water. Allah says they will ask for relief and they will be given yugathu but it's not the type of relief that they were that they want they will they will be given Allah says they will be given water that is like molten lead kalmuhl and this is, it's a very graphic ayah. Yeshwil wujuh. It's a type of water, a scolding water that will melt the faces. Now, again, I want to remind you, you know, bi'sa sharab, what an awful drink, what a terrible drink. Wasa'at murtafaqa, and what a terrible place to be. It's important for me to remind you, brothers and sisters, that these punishments are simply the manifestation of the reality of their souls. This adab is not an arbitrary punishment that Allah, he's just torturing them. No, this is, this is the reality of their souls. Jahannam is basically people confronting the darkness of their souls. You know, when you do something evil in this life, and you really think about it and you confront 
the evilness of your action, you suffer psychologically. In that life, in that world, people are going to, they're going to confront and they're going to experience the reality of their souls on a level that we cannot even comprehend. So this suffering is nothing but the result of realizing the reality of what they did to their souls in dunya. In dunya, they were escaping the reality. But in this life, they have to come to terms with the nature of their souls. So it's not that Allah is just saying that, you know, there's a sign on Jannah that says, do not enter. And they, they can go in, but the malaika are not letting them go in. No, they, they can't go to Jannah. Because Jannah is what? What is paradise? Paradise is the manifestation of pure souls. Mu'mineen in Jannah, what are they enjoying? They're enjoying the reality of the pure souls that they nurtured. Jannah is just you experiencing your own nafs because your nafs, your, the good qualities, your good deeds have now taken on a physical form. In hell, when we speak about fire and boiling water, again, we don't understand the reality of these things. But those things are just the manifestation of those wicked souls. So we shouldn't think that Allah is just this tyrant who's just burning and pouring water. No, th these, are, these are the realities of the soul that are being manifested. The soul is being unfolded in that world. So the suffering is just the suffering of the soul. And it's, it's suffering that the soul brought on itself. And Jannah is the soul enjoying the beautiful things and the pleasures that it inculcated. Now, going back to the, uh, to the ayah. So, we're, this is, so this is ayah number 40. And I, I think we'll conclude here, inshallah. Ayah number 40. بَلْ تَأْتِيهِمْ بَغْتَةً فَتَبْهَتُهُمْ فَلَا فَتَبْهَتُهُمْ فَلَا يَسْتَطِيعُونَ رَدَّهَا وَلَا هُمْ يُنْظَرُونَ So in the previous ayah, we mentioned that they're not going to be able to protect themselves from the fire with their hands. Do you know why they're not going to be able to protect themselves? So one reason we gave is that because they're going to be surrounded by the punishment. And Allah says what? Nay, but it will come upon them suddenly and confound them. Then they will not be able to repel it, nor will they be granted respite. You know, the punishment in Jahannam comes so quickly because the word بغتتن, it means something that happens suddenly and without any warning signs so one of the reasons why maybe that the the kuffar the the valimin, they can't protect themselves from the fire is because the fire the flame hits them so fast and so suddenly that they don't even have time to respond with a defense and they're going to be in a daze. You know when something, you know, you know, sometimes when you watch boxing, the boxer, his jab is so quick that the fighter can't even raise his hands to defend the blow. So here Allah is saying that the punishment, the flame, the adab, will hit them so hard and so fast and so unexpectedly that they won't be able to defend themselves. And Allah says, فتب, You know, Allah says, That they will be in a daze. They, will be, they, they won't even know what hit them. 
They will stand there completely stunned. You know, when people, when cops, they, they taser criminals, especially when the criminal doesn't see the taser, they, they get stunned. Allah, and look at how graphic these verses are. Allah is giving us a very real scene. So Allah is saying, I'm not going to tell you when this is going to happen, but let me explain to you what it will be like. That it will stun you. And it will stun you in a way you will be dumbfounded. And you will not be able to repel it. Why, why, why will you not be able, and nor will it be delayed. You know, when shaitan refused to do sujood to Adam, what did he, what did he ask? Allah says, you're mal'oon, you're rajim. Oh Allah, punish me, but don't punish me now. Punish me later. Allah says, now, today is the day where the punishment has come. And there's no later now. There's no delays. You will taste the full extent of the punishment. And Jahannam, my dear brothers and sisters, is a type of fire that is not like the fire in dunya. Fire in dunya, it burns haphazardly. But the fire in Jahannam has a very high level of conscience. So, because Allah says, Narullah al This is a fire. It's not ignited by gas. It's, ign it's ignited by the wrath of God. This is, a, this is Narullah. Allah attributes it to himself. Because it's such a fierce fire. This is a type of fire that looks deep into the hearts of people. Afida is the plural of fuad. So Jahannam is not this. Just random fire that just burns indiscriminately and haphazardly. No, no. Every flame, this is a fire that looks, it x-rays the heart of the person and it punishes them in accordance to the darkness of their soul. So Allah is telling them that, that now, Oh, Muhammad, number one, don't, these people don't deserve your concern. They don't deserve your care. They don't deserve your mercy, oh, Muhammad. Because whenever you talk to them, whenever you preach to them, they mock you, they laugh at you, and they taunt you. And they say, if hell is real, let us taste the punishment now. Allah says they talk a big game now. But there's going to come a day when they actually see that fire. And it's going to hit them so hard that it's, they're not going to be able to defend themselves. They're not going to know what hit them. And they're going to be in a daze. And even when they ask for help, they won't get help. Because now they have to confront the reality of the darkness of their own souls. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to protect us from that punishment. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to honor us with the, to save us from this punishment through the shafa'ah of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Uh, so that concludes our uh, discussion for tonight. Uh, if there are any questions or comments, uh, we'll uh, inshallah address them uh, now. Um, could you uh, elaborate a little bit more on the concept of universal mercy and versus the special mercy that the Prophet had for all people versus just the Muslims? Uh, how did those two differences manifest themselves? So, for example, when we when we speak about the Prophet being rahmatan lil alamin, rahmatan lil alamin, some of the urafa, some of the Muslim philosophers, they have this discussion about. You know, we have a hadith that indicate that the first thing that Allah created, we have many hadith about this. The first thing that Allah ever created was the light of the Prophet, the nur of the Prophet. And again, when we, when we, when we say light, we're not talking about the physical light with the photons. No, we're talking about this kind of immaterial, spiritual light, whatever you want to call it. The first thing that Allah created was the light of the Prophet. 
And from that light, a hadith say that he created the light of Ali and the light, the Anwar of Ahlul Bayt. The arwah of the Ahlul Bayt, they, were, they predated Adam. Now, so with that in mind, you know, if you look at Ziyaratul Jami'ah, when you read that Ziyarah by Imam Al-Hadi alayhi salam, you understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He created the most perfect created beings. And there's a reason why the that, that Allah has to start with the Prophet. That He has to create, there has, and this is something that's called Sinhiya in philosophy. You know, when, like for example, fire. Fire and burning, there's, there's a relationship between the two. There's a, there's a closeness between fire and burning. Allah begins creating a creation that has the least amount of limitations. And then... After that, the creatures have the creatures that come after that have even less limitations. So Allah created the Prophet, and from the Prophet, He created all other things. So one way of understanding, one example of this universal mercy is that we received the blessing of existence through the medium of the Prophet. You know, sometimes when you have an outlet and the voltage. And the voltage has to be has to be the right voltage, otherwise you burn the device because it cannot withstand the voltage. The only creature that can withstand that direct that direct experience with Allah is the Prophet. And Allah has to create this kind of filtration system, this buffer system. For so we cannot receive divine grace directly from Allah because we are. In, we are more, much more inferior. The only makhluk that has the least amount of limitations is Rasulullah. So it has to come through him, through Ali, and through the greatest of creation, and then existence reaches other, other uh, creations. So this is a very kind of philosophical, Irfani kind of way of speaking about how the Prophet's mercy is universal. So Rasulullah is even a rahmah for Adam. He's a rahmah for Jibra'il, for all. Because the ni'mah of existence reached everything through the Prophet. Because Allah is the absolute existence. And he had to create a creature that can receive existence from him directly. And to be able to have that kind of connection with the unlimited, supreme, absolute being, that creation has to be extremely powerful. Not, not independent, dependent upon God, but it's kind of like the, the concept of voltage, that there has, it has to be able to withstand. That's why only the Prophet can receive the Qur'an. لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله. It's not random that the Prophet's heart can only receive the Quran because Quran is so powerful that if it's given to anything else, it will, it will be destroyed. Right. So going back to the idea of the voltage, you'll get electrocuted. You can't handle the voltage. So existence has to pass through the creations that are least limited that are closest to the divine and then all other so the blessing of existence of life of riz of all of these things have to flow through this channel so again you know this is heavy stuff for people who don't understand the maqamat of ahlul bayt you know there are some people if you tell them that ali ibn abi talib is the first khalifa they'll get a rash let alone if you share these these type of ma'arif with them. And this is what this is really essentially what Ziyaratul Jami'ah is. Ziyaratul Jami'ah al Kabira is really all about how Ahlul Bayt, they have been, they are the tawassul, they are the wasila between Allah and his creation 
from the beginning of creation that that Adam, I mean, even if, even if you look at the story of Adam, وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا The arwah of the Ahlul Bayt were there before Adam. So even Adam came into existence because of them. But again, you know, this, this requires a long commentary. And maybe one day we'll, Allah gives us the tawfiq, we can do maybe a commentary on Ziyaratul Jami'ah Al-Kabira, so we can start to understand some of these uh, these realities. Inshallah. And even, I mean, just as one final comment, and I, I even mentioned this in, in Toronto when, during the Majalis, that the entire story of Iblis and Shaytan, Iblis and, and Adam, it really boils down to the fact that Iblis wanted to worship Allah without this institution of wasila. He didn't, he didn't like to wasila. He says, I want us to worship you directly. Allah says, no, you seek nearness to me through my chosen servants. You know, if Allah told Iblis, prostrate to me, believe me, he would have prostrated. He would have, Iblis would have had no problem doing sujood directly to Allah. He had problem with what? He had problem with an ibadah that included the wasila of Adam. So the whole the, the the beginning of the story of man is this 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 just being adamant about worshiping God directly, and even if you want to worship the God Allah directly, and even if you go to Surah Al Fatiha, it is you alone who we worship. You know, even when you want to send, if I want to send mail to Zayn directly. I still have to go through the post office. So saying that I go through Ahlul Bayt to seek Allah and going directly to Allah, that's not mutually exclusive. They're not mutually, because going directly to Allah entails that you go through the wasila. It's like the post office. If I want to mail something directly to you, I still have to go through the post office. Allah communicated to you and I through the through the, the Prophet. Allah could have gave revelation to each and every one of us. So Allah chose to spoke to He chose to speak to us through the wasil of the Prophet. So why is it so shocking to me that when I want to seek Allah, when I want to pray to Him, I also go through the same wasil in the back? So I don't know why people have such an issue with with tawassul and wasila. This whole religion is built on wasila. The beginning of the story of man is about wasila. The reason why shaitan is shaitan is because he insists on worshiping God the way that he wants to worship. You know, rejecting the intermediaries that Allah has authorized, that Allah has appointed. That was that's a really interesting point about Shaitan would have been very happy to worship Allah, but he just didn't want to worship him in this one manner. He he's been doing he was doing it for thousands of years. He had no problem with uh, with this direct worship, this this tawheed that the Wahhabis preach. Believe me, there, there is no I challenge anyone, bring me one difference between the aqidah of Iblis and the aqidah of these guys who are barking in baqi about you know, shirk and do this and do that who think they know tawheed they their their tawheed is the tawheed of iblis I, uh now if it's okay i'll uh, ask some questions from uh, last week's lecture that we weren't able to get around to so, um first question uh this is from a uh, eight-year-old uh he was asking um because you're referring to um the comments about how having skills and with Hollywood actors, uh, having those skills uh, hurt them. And so he's asking if I have a skill in soccer, uh, would that hurt me? And could you please elaborate a bit on that? So, so when, when I was talking about, you know, uh, you know, having these, uh, these skills, what I, what I was really saying was that if you pursue a skill and a passion, See, shaitan knows what our dunyawi inclinations are. And, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with developing any skill or any talent that you have. 
But the moment that you divorce Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from your life, what ends up happening is that your talent and your skill, which, which began as the source of your, your happiness and your purpose, it will become the source of your misery because you will think that this thing, independent of God, will bring me happiness. And it won't. It will leave you feeling empty. And that's why a lot of these athletes and actresses and actors, they excel in their fields. They develop their God-given talent. But if you divorce Allah from your life, you're going to realize that the only way for me to truly experience enduring happiness is for me to have a relationship with Allah. So what I was saying was that, you know, and this is the idea of tulul amal. Shaitan, he gives us false hope that if you, if you become the best soccer player in the world, you're going to be happy and your, your life is going to be everything. You're going to get what you want. Or if, you, if you're the best actress or you're the best, the point is, there's nothing wrong with pursuing your passions. That's not the problem. The problem is when you, when you think that what you're pursuing, that the passion that you're pursuing is going to bring you happiness independent of God. This is where the problem is. Uh, thank you. And, and could you also please elaborate a bit more on the definition of uh, nafs and the root word that it comes from? Because it's often used to refer to base desires, but it seemed like uh, you were implying it could mean any living being. So it depends on the context. So, for example, uh, you know, there are some, some ahadith and some ayat of the Quran where it's clear that nafs is not referring to just living things. You know, in the nafs la amaratun bisu. We know that, you know, this is talking about the human soul. We're not talking about the, 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 the nafs of, of other creatures because the, you know, the, the the nafs of other creatures is not going to have, it's not going to command them to do evil, right? Because shaitan is not targeting, you know, uh, animals or, or, or other creatures. So sometimes you have to look at the context. And we mentioned that the word, uh, I mean, just looking at the etymology of the word nafs, you know, there are, there are many words that have been derived for, you know, we said nafas, you know, breathing. Uh, when, a, when a woman experiences postpartum bleeding, she's, she's nufasa, you know, nifas. Because, because one of the characteristics of, you know, living things generally is that they bleed, right? So because living things have souls and living things generally bleed or they breathe, m many of them do, that some have said that, you know, maybe this is why there's, you know, a lot of these uh, words are associated with each other. But nafs, you see that, uh, you know, a lot of people confuse ruh with nafs. 